I'm very happy of being here today. It's an honor to, to speak as a strange loop. The title of my talk is From Video Games to Fashion, A Machine Learning Journey. And to be honest, it has been one of the most difficult talks for me to prepare. And this is due to my um, current or this summer professional circumstances. Let me start summarizing my, very briefly my, my experience to focus on the last um, stage to, that is going to be the focus of my talk. So I start back in 2005 working at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, the Particle Physics Accelerator in Geneva, working in the theoretical division, solving complex mathematical problems. When I was there, I wanted to, to apply my mathematical background to solve real world problems. So it was then when a colleague of mine told me, look, I mean, there is a company that is doing forecasting, bajeshan forecasting to solve some problems, so I joined. And this is when I started, and um, this is what I've been doing my whole career, solving practically sequential um, analysis, forecasting problems. So it was in um, 2010 that I moved to Germany to work in recurrent neural networks before all the deep learning thing started. And also, when people start talking about the um, actual big data sets, I joined the German weather service um, to work in numerical weather prediction. So um, I um, wanted to, to work with really big data sets, so I started working with satellite data. So, um, and this, was, this, this experience for me had a very strong influence for the rest of my career, because there I learned how to really put science into production. So numerical weather prediction systems are probably the most robust prediction um, system that we humans we have made. Since um, everything started after the Second World War and um, planes fly because of this operational prediction system. So the problem I was solving there, it was um, um, the, as probably you know, atmosphere dynamics is very highly chaotic. So the, Differential equations that govern um, the sky are very sensitive to the initial conditions. So the best initial conditions are coming from the satellite, but the satellite data are huge. So it's impossible to integrate those information into the numerical weather systems. So my problem was uh, precisely solve that, I mean, select the right amount of data quick to be able to, to put this information as, uh, uh, for the numerical weather system. So um, what I learned there is like, okay, we have this super cool, um, very robust prediction system operationally. Why this is not done in every industry that has a decent amount of data to have this, this system, I mean, working to support any decision um, at all levels of the, of the industry. So this was um, 2014, I moved to Japan uh, to work again with satellite data, Himawari 9, one satellite that uh, Japanese um, launched to the sky. And it was then when uh, I decided to change and apply, I mean, what I learned in the operational prediction system for other industries. And I found the Jokozuna Data. Jokozuna Data is a um, machine learning company, um, an operational machine learning platform that we built to predict individual player behavior. So the last four years, I've been working on this. And, um, and when I applied for my talk at the Strange Loop, I was still the CEO of uh, this company. So um, originally, I mean, the whole focus was going to talk about this, but life is complicated. And uh, this summer, I changed my career and uh, I joined Inditex. That turns out to be um, the largest fashion retailing organization. Maybe you know um, one of the most famous brands is Zara. So now I work for AI for fashion. So it was complicated for me to select the subject, but at the end there are many, many challenges and common places that both industry have. And this is what I'm going to talk today. So video game data, uh, the, um, sorry, the data that players generate are among the, one of the best data to describe human behavior. So when a player plays a game, uh, we express very nuanced motivations, emotions, um, strategic thinking, even addictions. So player data become perfect playground to understand um, play, I mean, human behavior. So this is one, one of the initial motivations to, to start working with those data sets. And also because um, traditionally they were not uh, properly using the data for, to understand player needs and to, to develop the games and to design the games. 
So um, which kind of um, operational platform we built in the last four years? Um, so we, we were predicting um, when a player is going to leave, player by player. So um, since you joined the game after three days, we know until which stage you're going to get, which kind of contest you're going to like, and um, which kind of um, risk you're able to take. So this one information that um, most of the game studios were not having. So this is what we're providing in an operational manner. So also connecting to the game, an item recommendation system, etc. So just because I know that some people, I mean, some, some people in the audience are working on this field. I mean, we, we have um, plenty of papers, and many papers published on this field. So if anyone is interested, I mean, we can talk later. So, um, and well, fashion industry. Um, so it's one of, a part of being one of the biggest industries in the world with a strong economical and uh, social impact worldwide. Um, is a, a way, I mean, it goes beyond a basic need. It's a way to define our personality, our individu individuality. It was very interesting for me what um, I watched one video of one of the data scientists from Cambridge Analytica that one of the most significant variables to, to predict um, the political um, preference were fashion and uh, music. So, um, so fashion uh, industry also relied a lot on human creativity to be extremely successful. So they also, similar to video games, were slower to realize of the potential of machine learning applications to, to include in all, in all the operations. So, but because of the huge amount and the rich data that uh, they generate, I believe that uh, this is going to, to change and it's going to be transformational for this industry. So in, I, I, I want to introduce Indie Text because I think it's an ideal example to, um, to the challenge that uh, the whole industry is facing. So Indie Text is an um, organization that, uh, I mean, um, covers the whole cycle um, since produ design, production, distribution, and uh, sales of the items, I mean, both in offline shops and also e-commerce. So, um, we have plenty of challenges, I mean, ranging from customer understanding, from uh, very complex supply chains, and focusing on um, sustainability. So, um, uh, able to predict uh, and to match every supply and demand, every piece of unsold clothes um, is, a, is an error, is a failure of the, of the matching between supply and demand. Also, we have uh, very interesting problem and interesting data sets we have um, what is called RFID. So we have a full track of every product, every item, since it's produced until it's sold. So we can understand all the dynamics of the shops and all the full track and behavior of, um, of dynamics of the, of, the, of the products. So what do those industries have in common? So um, that the success right now, I mean, relies on careful balancing art and science. So probably, I mean, the word art is what they, they have in common. I've been working with game designers for, um, for four years, and uh, probably um, the biggest challenges that I find in my job is that um, I work with humans. And humans has this issue that uh, it was, it was sown, I mean, by the work of Amos Bersky and Daniel Kahneman about behavioral economics, that, um, we are very bad making estimations, we are terrible doing predictions, and worse than that, we believe that we are great. So, um, I love this sentence, man is a deterministic device thrown into a probabilistic universe. So we, we think in a deterministic way, and yeah, every decision must be probabilistic. So this, these are actual notes from um, Amos. So, um, people predict very little and explain everything, so we are able to explain whatever with mm, any random thinking. This one, I mean, happens very often to me. People often work hard to obtain information they already have and avoid new knowledge. When I saw something that, um, that they know, uh, yeah, it's great, you're right. When, I find, when, when the data or the models say something that is extremely valuable because it's something that never seen, um, even with the same level of accuracy of the previous statement, so previous results, now this is wrong. 
and everything that has already happened must have been inevitable. Well, this is wrong. Maybe it was possible to, to avoid. So this is one of the biggest challenges, talking about precise challenges. I just pick up two of them from every, every field. So inventory management, as I said, um, fashion products has a very short life cycle with high level volatile demand and certainty. So the matching is, uh, is really complex and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to work on this. And even optimization, um, it, this is for video games. So, um, foresee the, how players are going to react to the different um, content of the video game is, uh, is crucial to understand I mean, and to generate new content. So particularly um, in game events. So optimize when is the right time to publish a particular event is crucial and to, 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 to be able to manage the game properly and be successful on it. So um, and probabilistic for, forecasting is um, is a some method that can help on both on both um, challenges. So, um, so estimating the probability distribution of a time series future given its past is going to be obviously key, and is still is still a very, I mean, open challenge to do it properly and be able to be in production in an operational manner. Um, and yeah, be able to, to generate content, I mean, accordingly based of, of the experience of the players and not only, not only be biased to one certain group of players, to be able to generalize and even go for, uh, in the direction of personalized games. So basically, what, um, what is needed, I mean, in both sides, maybe it's more evident um, for supply chain and retailing problems, but uh, also for video games, we need the right product at the right location, at the right time, with the right price. But not only for, for physical items, also for virtual items in video games. So which product, I mean, in which part in the evolution and dynamics of the game, and also time, and also price, virtual and actual. So these are two time series from um, a RPG game, a Japanese RPG game. So um, this, the first one are the sales, um, actual sales of the game, monetization, and the play time. So forecasting those time series are obviously crucial. I mean, sales because it's definitely needed. I mean, if the sales drop down, um, game developers can take action to, to try to, to, to keep it balanced. And play time because if, uh, I mean, we need to, to they need to, to, um, to have the resources of the servers ready if there is, there is a peak, for instance. So I'm going to talk about the autoregressive methods. So basically, we, uh, we want to explain, we want to forecast, we want to explain, um, we want to predict the future based on the past of the series. If we are going to talk about uh, autoregressive models, of course, we have to start with um, Boss and Jenkins' work, ARIMA models. Excuse me. So, um, you may be wondering, okay, I'm coming to a strange loop and they're going to talk about the model that was developed uh, in the 70s. Yes, I mean, because uh, it's still one of the, m of the methods that is most used for any, to solve almost all forecasting problems. These two, sorry, together with exponential smoothing. So, um, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's old, but it's still, I mean, even, LSTM or other combination and other networks for predicting time series, for, I mean, for doing time series forecast, still Arima is one of the best. So what, um, how it does, I mean, um, is um, try to decompose the, the series with the past information, the autoregressive part, integrated the trend of the time series and with the noise with the moving average side. Also distinguishing with um, the seasonality and, of course, you can include um, covariates to, to make those predictions. So here is a comparison of the time series I saw you before of the, um, of the, um, of the sales. This is a forecasting 30 days um, daily forecast. And here we, oops, here I compare um, dynamic regression, with this, which includes an ARIMA models and some covariates like vacation, like different game events or um, uh, weather. Uh, this is gener generalized additive mixed models. This is gradient boosting, and this is deep belief networks. 
So we are still, I mean, see that um, Arima outperforms the rest. And also when we are evaluating forecasting systems, we always have to take into account about the predictability and the minimum training set we need to, to do accurate and robust forecasts. So um, predictability means, I mean, I mean how, how the error is growing as a long time goes by. So um, what is the forecast horizon? So we can see, I mean, that um, in terms of predictability, uh, Arima and, um, and um, sorry, and the um, generative additive uh, mixed models uh, outperform the rest, and the same for the minimal training. So we need m less amount of information to start having decent forecasts. So um, I wanted to talk today because I'm pretty optimistic and we made several tests and it works pretty well with the model DeepR. So this is a model that it was developed by um, Amazon researchers in Germany. Uh, it was published in ICML 2017, and it's a recursive, uh, a recurrent neural network, uh, autoregressive recurrent neural network, that is able to learn from many ser time series, uh, maybe hundreds or thousands you need, but uh, it's able really to learn from the historical data and it's able to do predictions, individual predictions for every time series. So they use it for, this is what they use for, the, for doing the prediction of the demand for every product in Amazon website. So um, the goal is to model the conditional distribution of the future of each time series given its past. And uh, it's able to generalize from similar series and you don't need to do um, the manual work of, um, of uh, explicit uh, um, mark decisionality. It's, it really learns automatically from the, from the rest of the behavior of the time series. And as far as, I mean, it has been tested on our site too, doesn't overfit. So these um, AR, deep AR models um, has um, encoder decoding architecture. So basically a sequence to sequence that um, the output from the encoder and covariates, I mean, are after the encoder produced the different, I mean, the future steps in the, in the uh, as is marking the horizon. So it's an autoregressive model because the, the observation at the last time steps is introduced as an input for the next step. And it's recurrent because the previous output of the network is feedback as an input in the next step. So the goal of the, of the model, of the DPR model, is to, to model the conditional distribution of every future of, um, of every time series. So this is um, a schema of the, of, the, of, the, of the neural network. So this is the training set, and this is the, the, the prediction. So what it's what is using is the, um, I mean, as I said before, the, um, the, the target value, the, the truth of the previous steps introduces an input for the next step. And the re recurrent part is because the output of the network is feedback as a, uh, for the next step in the, in the network. So this is for the training set and for the, for the prediction, for the forecast. Of course, we don't have the truth. So then what is used is use a sample of all time series that is marked by the, by the likelihood that, I mean, is, um, is, a, is, a, is a result of the, um, of the network um, output. So um, to, to select what is the, the, um, the next um, time step, I mean, the next input coming from the previous step. So also something very interesting of, um, of this method is that uh, um, the likelihood is a fixed distribution, which parameters are given by a function from the network of the output, but it doesn't need to be Gaussian. It can be chosen among different, kind of different types of distributions. So we compare for the time series that we saw before with DPR and ARIMA, and uh, this is just a particular, um, I mean, a particular date, but um, we observe that, uh, that the steel, I mean, for this particular sample, DPR works better. If we compare with, um, with different dates, a steel ARIMA um, performs better in terms of accuracy, but uh, DPR results are, are, are very strong. We have a look for the minimum training that we need. 
still Arima works better, but um, but uh, the cold start is um, I mean is particularly powerful for DPR. So um, so even even that uh, the accuracy is lower, it's much easier to start with much less minimum training data to to start having robust predictions. Also for the simulation, as I said before, I mean this is this is important for video game industry be able and, and also for for almost every industry, simulate the effect of different promotion marketing campaigns um, or in-game events, how it's going to influence sales, how it's going to influence playtime, the engagement of the players, for instance. So in the case of Arima, um, the relationship between the, as the relationship between the output and the input is linear, uh, we can observe much easier how, how affect the output of interest, in this case, sales. But in the case of um, DPR, as it's much more complex model, it's much difficult to see the direct influence of these what-if scenarios. Just a summary of uh, what means uh, pros and cons of uh, forecasting with ARIMA. Linear relationship, easy to then compose, strongly explicative, but it needs a lot of manual work from the researchers. Can learn patterns across the other time series. You can have tons of time series they're not going to learn together. But it's very difficult to have cold start. You really need a minimum, maybe, I mean, it depends on the output, but data to start having forecasts. And the feature engineering is, is complex. With DPR, um, the feature engineering is, is pretty simple, as almost work with raw data. Learning process across the other time series, cold start is, is really nice. And it's able to, to, to forecast, even having many times, I mean, different variability in terms of magnitudes among the different time series. On the other hand, there is a um, lack of control. So at the end, you are, you are making predictions for every single product. So some, some of them are wrong, OK? But uh, it's difficult to control. And um, it's costly to train, OK? It's true that once you choose the parameters, everything is fine. But um, it takes some effort. And uh, at the end, it's a black box. I also wanted to talk today about uh, recommendation systems, as they are um, a common challenge in both in both uh, fields. Here is the um, this is a um, recommendation system that we built for um, for video game industry, and uh, the goal for recommendation system can be very diverse. It can be that uh, you go to, for instance, to an e-commerce platform and you buy the um, you make a big purchase. It can be that you you want uh, the, your users make uh, many but the small purchases. In this case, what we wanted is that uh, to maximize retention. So offer, recommend uh, virtual items to, to players in order that uh, they continue playing and they're happy with, uh, with the game, they're having fun. So um, what we want is to, um, to get um, player by player individually uh, the probability that, uh, the, um, the probability that the, of the next item they are going to purchase. Some um, challenges is that uh, to take into account all play style and behavior um, information, and also the time. Both industries has this, this challenge in terms of recommendation systems. It's not like, um, well, maybe with series, but it's not the big uh, challenge, like in Netflix or most of the pros in Amazon. So um, in video games and fashion, the time matters. I cannot give a reward to a player, a very big reward, a beginner, or because he's going to completely break the game, or I'm going to give something very small to, to a whale, I mean, a player that is at the end of the, of the game, because he's going to be completely offended and he's going to, to quit. So um, the time, I mean, is, is, is really important for this, this kind of recommendation system. And of course, the big data scalability. So this is an, uh, an example of how we solve this problem. So um, we have many items, too many. So um, it was very difficult to, to start doing collaborative filtering or doing ma any machine learning model. So the first thing we do is to, to reduce the dimensionality with using a super clustering. And, um, and then when we have the clusters, apply a machine learning model able to, to, to predict um, every player, which kind of cluster is more likely that they purchase Nest. Once we know the cluster that they will probably purchase Nest, 
we need to come back to the item space because at the end, this recommendation system is going to be connected to the, um, to the game. So the, the, the player needs to, to receive something there. So um, then we use a collaborative filtering for every single cluster to, to come back to the, to, the, um, to the item space. Just some details about how we did it. So um, first is the, um, the similarity matrix where we need to see how, what is the distance and this was also very complex um, um, between, the, between the items, what is similar, what is not, and also always taking into account the time frame. So we use the Grover distance to, um, to, com to, to, com to, to see what items were similar and um, because it was very flexible to work with categoric and numerical variables and uh, also we, use, we could use the raw outputs of this for the, um, for the unsupervised clustering method. We do an HDV scan for this because uh, only needs one parameter to be, um, uh, to be specified. It's able to identify outliers so don't create a cluster when it is an outlier and it's able to create clusters with different shapes. Then we use uh, ensemble learning. At the beginning we were using LSTM but extreme randomized traits was working better so we changed. So um, uh, we use extremely randomized trees to, to assign, uh, to predict what are the most likely clusters players are going to, um, to purchase next among those items inside of the clusters. So extremely randomized trees are, um, as, number say, as the name says, uh, very randomized trees, okay? So they are able to, I mean, normally decision trees works in a way that, um, that uh, the variable that is more correlated with the output of interest is, is how it's going to start growing the, the tree and the partition is going to be also based on the correlation. So in the, in the, stream, in the stream randomized trees, everything is random, okay? So this is extremely efficient and um, it's able to, it's also not, it doesn't give us biased results. Well, afterwards we do, we use a collaborative filtering to, um, to come back to, uh, to, the, to the item space, as I said before. So we use um, implicit feedback as a, um, as a, as a matrix uh, factorization um, algorithm. Also we use uh, alternating least squares. And, well, we train a collaborative filter for every single cluster, then we get the, um, the scores of the collaborative filtering per user, per cluster, and then the, the, the items with highest, pro, highest probability is the one that is assigned to every, to every player. Also, one of the challenges is the production part. So, um, being, um, so we are working with every single click players perform in a game. So this is the, the information we have for every user since they join the game. So be able to, um, and the same from item, be able to digest all this information and put it in production was particularly challenging. So starting from the part of the um, computation of probability per player and cluster, and the computation of the um, item similarity and clustering of items. So all these um, bottlenecks were done in a Spark. So and this is a summary of the of our system of um, that we put in production. So. We were using Cassandra's database. We have the front end, the web server. The heaviest computations were done in Spark and the lighter, I mean, the ones that we can, I mean, just in, in plain Java. When the, when the model is, um, I mean, needs to be uh, properly uh, parallelized, I mean, we were translating those models into Spark. But um, just to conclude, I mean, uh, of course there were we were facing many, to, to, to create operational systems in the industry, almost I think everywhere, we're having many technical challenges from scalability, from data cleaning, data preprocessing, but probably the most important challenge and the most difficult one is the communication. So the communication between data engineers and data scientists. So as probably you might, you know, you know, I mean, that engineers want something extremely scalable in, uh, in the code, in the big data infrastructure, and that the scientists want the most accurate model. So having a compromise between these two worlds is probably key for succeeding on this. And just to, to conclude, um, I wanted just to remark one, one sentence of one of the, the books. I, I, I really like this. I mean, probably you read, I mean, you read it and it's not a secret, super forecasting. So, um, 
In most cases, statistical algorithms beat subjective judgment, and in the handful of studies they don't, they usually tie. Given that algorithms are quick and cheap, unlike subjective judgment, a tie supports using the algorithm. The point is not indisputable. When you have a well-validated statistical algorithm, use it. Thank you.